Welcome to a very different service of worship for Palm and Passion Sunday here at Sundays at 6. We are so glad that you're here with us this evening. I am Christina Turner, and I am one of the pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And along with Annie Jewell, David Canning, and Justin Lacey, otherwise known as Annie Oak, I lead this little worship gathering that meets every Sunday night at 6 p.m. at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. That is, when we don't have a global pandemic. Right now, we are going to be sharing some music from Annie Oak from the past and also from different ones of our church members, um, some of our musical staff, and celebrating this service of Palm and Passion Sunday. This is a little bit different than we are used, used to being. We are used to being together. But even as we are in our living rooms, as we are in our patios or balconies, even as we are reliving memories of Palm Sundays and Holy Weeks from the past, I invite you to open your heart, to lift up your hands, to praise the Lord our God with me together. Um, throughout our service, you will see some clips of some of our some of our past worship services. We would love also, as you are worshiping, for you to click over and to go over to rightsvilleumc.org to learn more about what we are doing right now, to check over in our e-blast to see the events that are happening. If you need to be put on our email list, you can email susan at rightsvilleumc.org or call 256-4471. That's our church phone number and our staff is still answering that. We also encourage you, if you are able, now more than ever, we would love to have you give to the ministries and missions of our church. We are working as a church staff to trim our budget as well as we can and to be good stewards of our money. But I would love to invite you to work with me, work with all of us to help be God's hands and feet in this trying time. You can give by the old fashioned way, by writing a check and sending it to PO Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. Or you can give online at wrightsvilleumc.org or through our Wrightsville app. We also encourage you, we lift up all of our worship services happening this week. You can click over to our Facebook page to learn more about that or see your e-blast. We'll be offering Journey to the Cross, which is interactive, an interactive video journey through some artwork, prayers, and music. We also are going to be emailing out a liturgy for you to share with friends or family, whoever you're self-isolated with, or even with a friend over the phone. I'll be hosting, for those of us who don't have someone to spend that Monday Thursday service with, I'll be hosting a Zoom call. And so check your e-blast for information on how to dial in for that as well. And we are also going to be gathering at Easter sunrise for a service online. We will be offering scripture, prayers, etc., from the end of the Oceanic Pier. And so we'd love for you to tune in on Easter sunrise to see that. And also we'll be having a service that is that will be led by our bishop, Bishop Hope Morgan Ward, that will be li available for live stream on Sunday morning. So we would love to have you join us for that. And last but not least, we thank you so much for your generosity to all of the charities and all the nonprofits that are reaching out to folks during this time. I am blessed to work with our outreach committee and they have worked already to provide a birthday party to and some needed, needed gifts to two twin one-year-old boys through a safe place, one of our organizations that we're highlighting this week. A Safe Place works with women to help them escape from trafficking, many of whom are, were there because of situations beyond their control. A Safe Place works to help empower women and to uh, teach them new skills and to lead them into a new way of living and a, a new lucrative um, careers. And so we'd encourage you to give. You can write that in the memo line of your check, or you can allocate part of your tithes and offerings um, on our website by going over to rightsvilleumc.org and clicking over in the memo outreach slash a safe place. And now I invite you to worship the Lord our God with me and to pray with me this opening prayer. O oh, Holy One, we give thanks to you for you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. Open the gates, open our minds to a new way to praise you and give us courage to walk through. Help us lay down our cloaks and lay down our expectations about who you are and what you are doing. We walk with you this journey to Jerusalem 
and we give thanks to you, for you are good, O oh God. Your love endures forever. Help us lift up our branches, our palms, and our hearts, wherever we are. Give us breath, O oh God, to boldly proclaim your praise. We give thanks to you, God, for you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. We cry, O oh God, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Now I invite you to settle in and to prepare your hearts to listen to our worship band, Annie Oak, as they sing to us a song of praise to God this Palm Sunday in Spanish. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say to them, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples did and went as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, they had put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God from us, for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Palm and Passion Sunday reminds us that it is not just a straight line from the palm parade and the words the, of the children, the waving of palm branches and the shouting of Hosanna. It's not a jump from there to the empty tomb on Easter morning. It goes through the Garden of Gethsemane. It goes through the hill called Calvary. It goes through the cross. And so now I invite you to hear this reading, this reading often that we read on Good Friday, a Friday that is only called good because it reminds us of the depth of God's love for us. It reminds us that no matter where we are, no matter how alone, no matter how hopeless our situations feel, that Jesus has been there before us and that, and that God's love says that there is no place, no place that is not redeemable. Hear these words. Now, when Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But Jesus gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus, Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Messiah or Christ? For Pilate realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed Jesus over. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, why, what evil has he done? But the crowd shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am an innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. They gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of his robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry Jesus' cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two thieves were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and then we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The thieves who were crucified with Jesus also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. 
At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then just Jesus cried aloud with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified. And they said, truly this man was God's son. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Jesus, name above all names. As you emptied yourself for others, so we offer ourselves empty this week. We offer our gifts to you as a sign of hope in your coming kingdom. Where there is death, bring life. Where there is sorrow, bring joy. Where there is injustice, bring courage for change. And we ask all these things in your name, the one who is received with words of praise and the one who suffered for us. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each and every heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So when you're a pastor, you get to hear some things about God that will really make you cringe. I somehow was born without the ability to make my face look normal when someone says something weird. Church staff, if you haven't noticed, sometimes get tired and need to paste on what we like to call a Chick-fil-A smile. You will know this when you see it, if you've been to a Chick-fil-A. When we're back in the church building, if you see me beaming from ear to ear on what is otherwise a terrible morning, you will know that I have put on the Chick-fil-A smile. I do this sometimes also when someone tells me something tragic has happened because God needed another angel. Or when someone says, God helps those who help themselves or other platitudes like that. But sometimes, sometimes your face will betray you. And I get this strange look on my face in which I kind of cock my head and say, God doesn't do that. I remember when I was 18, Many of you have heard the story about how my dad was diagnosed with brain cancer, how he died at age 45. I remember someone whispering to my mom at the funeral home at the visitation, at least you're still young. You can get married again, they said. I hear things all the time as a pastor. Well, at least he didn't suffer long. There's the classic God needed another angel. Well, you know, that was bound to happen with him smoking like that all of his life. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Or this poem 
God's garden is beautiful. God only takes the best. I think that one may be my least favorite. God uprooting, plucking up someone you love and taking them to transplant in God's heavenly garden. Why can't God find God's own flowers to plant, I wonder? Sometimes we find comfort in these phrases, especially during times that are difficult. Sometimes these phrases even comfort us. But usually they are there for those weeks, those days, those moments, those hours, when everything around us is changing so fast that we can't remember what day it is, what life used to look like, when the last time it was that we showered. We need to make meaning. And sometimes we do that through saying those platitudes those empty phrases, those things that we say just so we don't have to sit in the silence and wonder why. We need to make meaning. We as human beings are meaning-making creatures. <laughs> Sometimes everything comes at us in life, even normal days, so fast and so furious, and our brains are tired. We need a cause and effect relationship. We want to find a simple answer. And so sometimes we say, I say, God did it, we say. This is God's will. This is God's plan. These sorts of things are acts of God. This week, as we were in week three of what I like to call Cancel Palooza, the week in which we declare everything is canceled or postponed. Azalea Festival Parade? Canceled. People's Weddings? Canceled. Easter Brunch with everyone's finest seersucker or smock dresses? Canceled. Mission Trips? Youth Camps? Being in the room with your firstborn grandchild when she is born, getting to smell the top of her head for the first time, postponed, if not canceled. I was talking to some friends about a conference they were hoping to have. It's coming up on big Methodist conference season and everyone is wondering, do we postpone? Do we cancel? When is all of this going to be over? When do we confirm our confirmands? When do we elect new bishops? When do we have meetings to ordain new pastors? We don't know. It's those Good Fridays, those Holy Saturdays sorts of days. There are lots of them, it seems, one after another after another, where we're just waiting, we're just wondering, we're just faced over and over with our helplessness. Everyone in this conversation was wondering, how do you get a refund for your money? Is it if the convention center or the venue cancels or do we need to cancel and then they'll cancel and refund us? No one quite knows. And so someone brought up, they said, well, maybe we can get a refund or can't get a refund if it's an act of God. They said, an act of God? Someone hadn't heard about that. And they said, yes, an act of God. It refers to something you can't control, something catastrophic like wind or hail, hurricanes or floods. Or you could say a pandemic, which is going to be in everybody's most recent insurance writers. An act of God. I was researching this for this sermon, and I did what I usually do, Googled, what is an act of God? And so here you go, a bit of free legal education, no student loans required. From one legal website, an act of God is a natural catastrophe which no one can prevent, such as an earthquake, a tidal wave, a volcanic eruption, a hurricane, or a tornado. Acts of God are a legal excuse for delay or failure to fulfill an obligation or to complete a project. An act of God, said another person in this meeting. He said, that's horrible theology. We need to fix that. It makes it sound like God is just sitting around throwing out wrath like bolts of lightning. You get a war and you get a plague. You get a child chained up by addiction. You get a hurricane, you get a disease. That's not the God we worship, this friend said. But another friend, very practical and detail-oriented said, well, I explained you just can't get rid of the phrase act of God. This is a legal term. This is a specific meaning that's used to settle insurance claims. This is the way it's been for years and years and years. You can't just change it. I get it. There are laws, there are precedents. <laughs> There are official legal things that I don't understand with my seminary education. But I have to admit, I agree with my friend. I have a problem with this phrase, act of God. Because this angry God, this God who sends down earthquakes and tornadoes, volcanoes and tidal waves, and possibly for the purposes of insurance pandemics, 
this God is not a God that I know. I wonder about God, why? Why don't we ever say that a parade of palm waving children with smiles on their faces, racing down the aisles of church, why don't we say this is an act of God? Why do we never say the sun rising every morning, dyeing the sky over Wrightsville Beach, the colors of the rainbow? Why don't we say this is an act of God? Why don't we ever eat the bread and drink the juice of communion and say, you know what? This simple meal, a holy snack, really, this is an act of God. The God who is the bread of life, who feeds us until we want no more. Why do we only consider these tragedies, these difficult things as act of God? Why do we never count God's mercies new every morning and every evening and every hour in between? Why do we not point out those things and say this, this, this is an act of God? The people in Jesus' day thought that this crucifixion was an act of God. Jesus had had people that had had it in for him ever since his very first miracle, ever since he was born and some magi came to find him, to worship him, who had the audacity to call him the king of the Jews. Those people throughout Jesus's life always said, Jesus, you've gotten a bit too big for your britches. Who do you think you are? You can imagine them saying with all this, this is my body, this is my blood nonsense. Who do you think you are to forgive sins, to eat with sinners, to talk to prostitutes, to throw out grace like it was free? Who do you think you are? A person commandeering a donkey and parading into Jerusalem like you're some kind of king. Who do you think you are? These people in Jesus' life, like so many of us in so many of our lives, when we see someone who looks like they've gotten a bit big for their britches, they say, it's about ready, it's about time for you to be brought down a notch. Clearly, said the people, said the thieves on the cross, this man is being punished. Clearly, said the Pharisees, said the Roman soldiers. Clearly, God's not with him. If he was, then where is God now? Where is your God while you're suffering? Where is your God? Why doesn't he bring you down from this cross? If you, if God delights in you, then why doesn't God deliver you? Why doesn't God deliver you? Is it something that you did wrong? They say to Jesus, is it because God isn't there at all? We listen to Jesus say these words, these painful words from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's something that you kind of want to put your hands over your ears, earmuffs, like you say to children. Don't listen to that. It's too hard. It's too disturbing. Could this, is this, this punishment, this cruelty, this violence on Good Friday, is this the act of an angry God who just needs to watch people suffer? I wonder in times like this, what is the theology that we fall back on? What, how do we make sense of the cross? It's hard to understand even in a normal year, and this year is not normal. There's nothing about 2020 that has been normal so far, and nothing tells me that it's going to be normal for a while to come. I was thinking this week about how this is a, not a normal Holy Week in Easter. I said it to Pastor Doug. I said, this, is, this is the, must be the strangest Easter and Holy Week celebration that anyone has ever had. And, I, and he said, well, I don't think so. I said, well, maybe not the strangest one that Jesus and his disciples had. And he said, or Mary Magdalene. Then he said, or people during wartime. And then I thought about the others about people who have felt forsaken by God for years, about Christians in other areas of the world who feel persecuted, those who are not able to gather, um, those who feel locked in their homes, not because of a disease, but because they're afraid, afraid to say the name of Jesus because of persecution, afraid of violence outside their doors, afraid of a thousand other things. I wonder 
if this Holy Week is an invitation, even amidst the suffering of our world, to share in the sufferings, not just of Jesus, but of Jesus's friends throughout the world and throughout history. When I was in divinity school, spilling thousands of gallons of ink and killing what seems like thousands of trees, writing papers to explain words like salvation and grace and atonement, we spent hours, months, maybe years even, trying to understand what this week means. What does it mean for Jesus, fully God and fully human, to go into Jerusalem, to be praised, to sit at a table with his friends and give them bread and wine and say that this is my body and my blood. For Jesus then within the scope of a week to be forsaken, to be mocked, to be hurled insults at, to be crucified and to die, rejected and alone. Why did it happen? Why did Jesus have to die? It's a question that we ask aspiring pastors on the committees that we're in. It's a question I wrote a lot of papers on and a question that we talk about in confirmation class. The easy answer is Jesus died for our sins. But what does that even mean? Jesus died so that we can be raised to life, we say. But what does that look like when it seems like life is so far away? What does it mean to say that Jesus died for our sins? Does it mean that Jesus um, is an emissary to a cruel God that needs someone to suffer? We wonder the troubling thought, is God just like an abuser who gets mad and Jesus stands between him and us taking the hits from his angry dad to protect us? I don't have a lot of answers, but I do have one, sir, one answer for that, no because Jesus is what God looks like. And we want to, when we want to know the character of God, we don't look at the portrait of an angry God who throws down thunderbolts like Zeus. The God that um, original fire and brimstone preacher Jonathan Edwards talked about a couple of centuries ago. If you're not familiar with it, he wrote a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And this sermon is, to put it lightly, grim. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're one of those people who are watching the movie Contagion right now. I could imagine good old Johnny E saying, look at all these folks in 2020. Look at what they've done. It's this feeling that God allows bad things to happen to us, to punish us, to smack us into shape. Is this a go to your room and think about what you're, you've done moment to all of us? for being too busy or polluting the environment, going to too many bars or too many clubs, being out on too many boats instead of going to church, not spending enough time with our families, not spending enough time with alone, not resting enough. Is this some sort of message from God? You didn't wash your hands enough. You didn't wear white, bef you wore white before Memorial Day. You were drinking when you should have been praying. You were golfing when you should have been in church. You were working too much. And you should have been home with your family. And now look what, you, what you're getting, what came to you. You're at home with no job at all. Where is God? What is God doing? We wonder in the Good Fridays of our lives, are these moments of suffering? Is Jesus hanging on a cross, taking his last breaths? Are these the acts of an angry God? Scripture has a lot of words to describe God. Um, they, and we have made our, our, our way through scripture by thinking of a couple God in a couple different ways. Sometimes we say God is cruel, especially we look at the God of the Old Testament and contrast him with the God of the New Testament, as if the same God wasn't the God of all. Sometimes we think God is either angry or God must be absent when we most need him. God, is God just standing by, kind of nice, but mostly helpless, patting your head like a confused old grandfather, giving you a Werther's original and saying, it'll all be okay, just trust. Where is God? Is this an act of God? What is God doing? It's that question that they lobbed at Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. And the biggest tragedy 
the most unprecedented moment in human history. I think Jonathan Edwards had one thing right. We are sinners, all of us. It's not a word I like to use because who wants to be called a sinner? I don't. And yet in this week of all weeks, this holy week, we are faced with the reality that we are people who have fallen short, who have fallen short of the glory of God. We are invited to this truth, not because we think that God is punishing us and we need to fess up so that we can get back to normal. But sometimes in moments of our lives, in the Good Fridays, in the Ash Wednesdays, sometimes when everything is stripped away from us, sometimes we can see things more clearly. Sometimes when we see the depth of God's love for us, when we look at our Jesus kneeling in the garden, when we see our Jesus who refused to curse others even when they stripped him and put a crown of thorns upon his head, when we look at our Jesus who offered mercy to a thief on the cross, we are faced with our own limitations. Could we do that? We say, no, probably not. We're about to lose it when we've been in our house for about three weeks. We certainly face with the biggest catastrophe that life had to offer wouldn't be like Jesus. We wouldn't say, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. When we look at our Jesus, we realize just how short we fall. We realize just how much we need him to heal us. We realize just how much we need him to act in us and with us to make us new. When we look at the love of God that is stripped bare in Jesus, that naked kind of love, we say this. It's a prayer we usually say on Monday Thursday when we confess our sins before God. This year is the first Monday Thursday in about 15 that I haven't served or received communion. It's going to be one that I remember for the rest of my life, I think. Not because I thought, oh, God was saying, look, you didn't appreciate communion enough, so I'm going to take it away, like a mom taking video games away from their 10-year-old. I'm going to remember it because at this time, I've been more hungry to be at the table with you than I ever have been before. I remember this confession, this confession that we say together. Holy God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In this time of confusion, in this time that might strip us bare, that might feel make us feel naked without all of our usual coping mechanisms, all of our usual solutions. I wonder if this is an act of God, that God looks at us tenderly, broken and sinful as we are, and tells us this. God tells us, hear the good news. Christ died for you while you were yet a sinner. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Where is God? What is God doing? What is an act of God? It's this, that sometime years and years back, maybe even at the beginning when all of this started to go wrong in the garden, when we started to forget who we were, who we were made to be by God, when we started to look out for ourselves, when we started to choose self-destruction instead of love, when we chose a thousand smaller gods instead of the God who would bring us life, I imagine that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together started to write a story. A story so crazy, so weird, with so many plot twists, it would make the months of March and April 2020 look practically normal. The story went like this. Everything was broken. Things didn't work the way God made them to. We chose sin over goodness. We chose to turn away instead of staying in love with God. And with that choice, all sorts of things began to rush in. Diseases started to emerge. Hate and murder, cruelty and abuse. 
coronavirus and cancer and everything in between. A result of our fallen world. But the good news is that God kept acting. God would not give up. When God's people were stuck in Egypt, held in slavery, with nowhere to go, God acted. God said, let my people go. And then there was an act of God. The angel passed over those houses of Israel. God brought God's people out of Egypt, out of slavery. And when they passed through the sea on dry land to freedom, you could see that was an act of God. When those people forgot real quick and decided that, well, maybe we better hedge our bets and make another God. You know, like a God in the shape of a cow that you melt down all your gold earrings into and worship, you know, just in case the other God isn't working. When they looked at the gold earring cow, this is really in scripture, I'm telling you it's crazy. When they looked in Exodus 32, 5 at the gold earring cow and they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Moses came down off that mountain and threw the tablets on the ground in anger, God said, could have said, you know, I'm done. I'm finished. This experiment is over. But instead, Moses prayed. God gave him new tablets, new commandments. And then God acted. As Moses sat at the top of that mountain, God passed by. God told Moses, this is my name. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. I keep steadfast love for the thousandth generation. I forgive iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clear the guilty, but visit the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. This last little bit we focus on. We think of the punishing God the cruel God, the God that we have made up out of our own imaginings, a God who likes to punish our enemies. But that's not news, is it? We know how the world works, that sin that infects us gets passed on like a virus, that the child of an abuser is more likely to abuse, that we inherit from our parents the brokenness of generations ahead of us. That isn't news, that the earth we pollute will be polluted for our grandchildren, that when we are raised with cruelty, we are more likely to become cruel. That's not news. What is news? What is news is that God says, let me tell you my name, that my name means mercy. It means grace. It means steadfast love and faithfulness. It means forgiveness of transgressions and sins. It means that I now and forever are for you. God was not done writing that story because in that story that no one could have predicted, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood, not socially distanced, not six feet away, but right here. In him, we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten one, full of grace and truth. That was an act of God. He was in the world. The world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to who was his own and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. That was an act of God. Jesus, the world, the word made flesh walked around, God with skin on. Jesus was hurt. He had the wind knocked out of him. He could feel the warmth on his face on a sunny day. He could look out at the rolling hills that surrounded the Sea of Galilee. Enjoy that view, just as beautiful as when he first crafted it. In, with his fingers at the beginning. Jesus healed the sick and the power of God flowed through him like a cure. He didn't catch sickness from them. They caught wholeness from him. Jesus ate with sinful people and the power of God flowed through him like a medicine. He didn't catch sin from them. They caught righteousness from him. That was an act of God. But mercy was too much for us. We didn't like it. We still don't. We want the good, which is usually us, to be rewarded. The bad, which is usually them, to be punished. Life doesn't make sense. We want God to show mercy, but not to those sinners. We want God to overlook our sins and not others. We're kind of like the prophet Jonah. Jonah, who was asked to go to Nineveh, that evil, sinful city. 
Jonah turned around, he went the other way, and then when he came back, after he had been socially distanced for a few days in the belly of a large fish, he finally went, and with a bit too much glee, he said, he proclaimed to the city, God is going to destroy you. You will pay for what you've done. Forty days more, and Nineveh will be overthrown. But see, God acted in a different way than you would think. Plot twist, all those people turned away from their sins. All those people turned back to God. There was an act of God, and God chose mercy. This is in scripture, I quote, I'm telling you, this is stranger than the Tiger King. This was displeasing to Jonah, God's mercy. He became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is that not what I said while I was still in my own country? I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. This is insane. Jonah says, I knew you were merciful. I knew that you were going to show them mercy like you always do just like you to show mercy. It's just like you. This Friday, we will journey to the cross and just like the earliest Christians and Christians who are scared to gather from worship every day, not just during coronavirus season, we will be there, all of us, imperfect and broken, mended, scared, hopeful, brave, fearful, helpless, waiting waiting for God to take on our sins and cure them, waiting for God to heal our vindictiveness, our cruelty, our brokenness, and turn them into the righteousness of Jesus. We wait. We will be waiting in our homes or working at the hospital, waiting as we save lives. We will be waiting, waiting as we cleanse buildings or give people nourishing food. We will be waiting in the hospital or the office or the nursing home. We will be waiting together or waiting alone. We will be waiting for God to do what we can never do for ourselves. Waiting for God to be mocked so that there is someone beside us when we are bullied. We will be waiting for God to die and rise again so that we can know life. We will be waiting waiting for an act of God. There's a story circulating around. I read it and it's still the first news story that comes up when you Google Italian priest ventilator. It's a beautiful story, a story that took my breath away. A story that I imagine they'll be telling in 50 years in everyone's Holy Week and Easter sermons. People like me will be insufferable then. Let's see, I'm 36, and so I'll be 86 at the time. And I'll be running around the church telling all the kids, wash your hands for 20 seconds. We will be the new Depression-era grandmothers who rationed the last tiny inch of tinfoil. Our grandkids will say, oh no, another story about how you couldn't come to church for Easter because of coronavirus. Those are so cliche if I hear this one more time. Maybe we'll tell this story. The story of a priest who went viral on Twitter, a smiling priest, Don Giuseppe Baradelli, standing in front of a romantic Italian church. The tweet went like this. This priest, suffering from the coronavirus, gave up his ventilator to give to a younger patient. He has died. His name was Don Giuseppe Baradelli. He was 72 years old from Bergamo, Italy. This was shared over 48,000 times and liked many more. Father Berardelli, I learned, was a priest for 47 years. He was beloved. He loved his community. He was self selfless. He served them well. He had pre-existing respiratory problems, and so his church had bought him a respirator to use. And when coronavirus devastated the region, like so many other people and priests, Father Berardelli succumbed. He was given this ventilator, this respirator, but then he saw someone else, someone who was younger, who needed it more than he did, who had many more years of life. He looked at the hospital staff and he said, I want them to have it instead. And Father Baradelli died. It's a gorgeous story, one that deserves to go viral, a story of greater love that no man has than this to lay down his life for his friends. 
But here's the problem. Father Berardelli's story isn't actually true. A Catholic news site published, in reality, um, one of his friends, Giuseppe Foresti, the sacristan of Berardelli's parish of St. John the Baptist, 15 miles from Bergamo, said, the elderly priest simply couldn't tolerate the ventilator, partially because of his pre-existing health conditions. It was making him worse. He chose to go into the arms of God. He refused to use the ventilator. There was not a donated respirator, a spokesperson said. The problem was when he got to the hospital, he couldn't handle it. It's one of those stories that makes you think, makes you think about fake news and about rumors and about whether anything is actually true. But as I read again, I read this story, something that his friend said also about him. He said, Father Berardelli didn't do this act of selfless love. He didn't give his life for someone else, but he would have if he could. The story of this man, this disciple of Jesus, whom God had acted within him, the story that maybe this man didn't give his life for someone else, but don't you want to be the kind of person that if a story, a rumor circulates that you gave your life for someone, that everyone would believe it as if it was true? Some of us will probably retell this story as true. It will go on and on. Maybe in 50 years, everyone will know it. And maybe it should. Because this story maybe points to a story that is truer now than ever. The story of a Lord who could give his life for someone else and who did. A story of Jesus who, because he laid down his life for us, made us new. Gave us his spirit to live within us so that we can act like God. We can show endless mercy, boundless compassion, incomprehensible love. Save yourself, they told Jesus, but he did not. Come down from the cross now, they told him, but he didn't. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now. But deliverance was what he did by staying on that cross for us. He will not come down. He will stay there for you and for me so that no matter what happens to us, we will know that Jesus has already faced the worst that could ever happen. No matter what happens, friends, we will know that we are not alone. Rest in this mercy. Rest in this love. Know that this is an act of God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? O oh God, this strange Holy Week, we stand at your gate, hesitant and uncertain. We are reluctant to answer your invitation. We are slow to embark on the journey towards your reign of love. We stand at your cross needing your mercy, needing your peace, needing a love that is beyond our understanding, a love that does not make sense. Forgive us, God, we pray. Grant us the help we need to be your people, the courage to give ourselves for others, the courage to join you in your procession, the selflessness to lay our cloaks and our hearts before you, the courage to follow you to the cross, and the knowledge to rest and to know that by your grace, we are forgiven. Amen. I invite you, friends, before you go into this holy week, to take a breath, to remember that you are beloved by God, to know that God's love is beyond your imagining, and to hear this song by Annie Oak that reminds us of the never-failing mercy of the God who acts for us. Amen. Tremble, tremble, tremble. Were 
Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him through the side? Were you there when they pierced him through the side? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they pierced him through the side? And were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Thank you.